Since that time, they have gone on to delight audiences nationwide with their wisdom, compassion, and humor. Even though they were born on opposite sides of the globe and grew up in very different cultures, Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra evolved along similar paths. They both earned doctoral degrees, Dr. Dyer in counseling psychology, Dr. Chopra in medicine. And they embarked on successor and Dr. Chopra evolved along similar paths. They both earned doctoral degrees, Dr. Dyer in counseling psychology, Dr. Chopra in medicine and they embarked on successful careers in their chosen fields. However, like all great thinkers, they soon realized that they had more to offer than was available in the confines of established doctrines. Setting out on their separate journeys, they explored concepts and ideas ranging from the texts of ancient philosophies to the latest scientific advances. Today they have emerged as world leaders in the fields of self-development and mind-body medicine. These best-selling authors have brought us The Sky's the Limit, You'll See It When You Believe It, and Real Magic from Dr. Dyer, and Quantum Healing, Perfect Health, and Unconditional Life from Dr. Chopra. They have separately authored many audio tapes and have appeared on major television and radio shows worldwide. Recently, Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra met again at the Church of Today in Warren, Michigan to create a very unique event that Quantum Publications is now pleased to offer you. The program begins with individual talks by Dr. Dyer and Dr. Chopra and concludes with a highly entertaining interaction between these two great minds. This tape series is dedicated to the memory of Reverend Jack Boland, a great friend of mankind and a true believer in living beyond miracles. Now let's join Dr. Wayne Dyer. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I would like to introduce, before I begin, my soulmate. My, my precious wife, the woman who is so supportive and caring, the mother of seven of our children, the person who really guides me. When I heard Bette Midler sing, You Are the Wind Beneath My Wings, <laughs> I knew that she was dedicating that to my wife, Marcy, Marcy Dyer, who's here with me today. I love you. I said to Marcy not too long ago, because you wonder, I said, if I didn't have all the money that I have, <laughs> would you still love me? It's just a question. It was. She said, of course I would love you. She said, I'd miss you, but... I would still love you. <laughs> no, she didn't really say that. <laughs> and so, uh, this special day is born. A day that, uh, that I've dreamed about for a long time. The way that Deepak and I came together is really an intriguing story to me. It's, um, it's really an example of what the message we both have in our books and tapes and our live performances around the world. That there are no accidents, that the universe is on purpose, that uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, that the right person will show up and has always been there. I mean, this is a a man that grew up on the other side of the world, in New Delhi. The uh, son of a physician, a man who went to medical school, who lived around the world and uh, became a world-famous endocrinologist. And I grew up a little bit before, but not much, <laughs> here in Detroit delivering pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
we come together in a strange set of circumstances when my wife discovers that she has a uh, growth on her thyroid and um, has gone to several physicians, all of whom have told her that uh, she's going to have to have surgery and that it could be cancerous. And uh, my wife has a very powerful um, knowing within her. It's very different than a belief. It's beyond believing. It is, uh, I've seen her do it in uh, giving birth to uh, five of the births of our children. I was there and I watched her go into another state of consciousness and literally uh, uh, become some other human being as she went through this uh, process of uh, without ever complaining, without ever uh, whining, without ever asking for any medication or any help, using this very powerful inner source and, uh, and teaching me how to go along there with her <laughs> to do it. it was, I've seen her do that and I knew that she had this knowing when she was uh, told that, uh, that she had this growth. Now I had heard of uh, the name Deepak Chopra uh, as just a funny Indian name. Um, I mean, who's named Deepak? I mean, please. <laughs> I promise you, at Denby High School, there wasn't a Deepak in any of my classes. <laughs> and I'm sure in New Delhi, there wasn't a Wayne either. <laughs> and so I uh, called the people at Nightingale Conan, who produced my tapes, and I said, I would like you to send me the best tapes that you can send on self-healing. And they said, well, we only have one that con constitutes the best. And they sent me Magical Mind, Magical Body. And I listened to them that day. And I turned them over to my wife. And she listened to them. And she said, uh, I've got to meet this man. I've got to ask him about this uh, thyroid thing. And lo and behold, the next Saturday, Deepak and I were on a program together in San Francisco that Louise Hay has been putting on Visions of the Future. And after his talk early in the morning, I was speaking in late in the afternoon and he was on in the morning, I went over to this man where there were hundreds of people standing in line asking for autographs. And he stopped and he turned around and he looked at me and he said, I've always respected and admired you. Now this is a physician. <laughs> It hasn't ever happened in my life that a physician, <laughs> an MD, <laughs> has turned around and said those words to me. And I had an instant, what they call in Buddhism a satorai, a, an instant kind of awakening, a, a feeling of love for a man that I don't think I'd ever experienced before. It was like, it was like a, a falling in love in a moment. I felt an enormous kinship. I, I felt that we were brothers who were brought together from different parts of the world. Three weeks later, we were again on the same program in Seattle, and I told Deepak about the, my wife's thyroid, and he said, bring her to Seattle. And we flew out to Seattle and spoke again and had lunch. And since that day, we have become fast, friends, colleagues, and my new book, which will be out um, in about two months, is dedicated to Deepak. My wife went to the Ayurvedic Health Center in Lancaster, and at the end of a week, with her knowing, and with meditation and Panchakarma treatments, she had shrunk that nodule down to where it's almost invisible. So there is something that brings people together. Thursday night, Marcy and I had dinner with the sixth man to walk on the moon, Edgar Mitchell. Someone you might want to think about bringing to your church sometime, Michael, a wonderful spiritual man. Dr. Mitchell and his wife, Sheila, 
And I got, we were talking in this restaurant, this Thai restaurant in, in uh, Florida, and he talked a little bit about his experience in space. And one of the things that he said that he had when he was in space was this incredible awakening. When he, let, when he came back in, from the Apollo 14 mission in 1971 after walking on the moon, he left the astronaut corps very shortly thereafter because he no longer felt that he was a scientist. <laughs> he, was, he had gone from being a scientist to being, being a spiritual metaphysician. He had an awareness, he said, that there are, there is an intelligence to this entire system that we all find ourselves a part of. And that intelligence, even though it's invisible, is so powerful and so perfect. He said, I looked to the left and I could see an infinity of perfection. Every single planet and every single star to infinity was perfectly synchronized and in perfect movement, moving at thousands of miles an hour to who knows where <laughs> and from who knows where. All connected by some invisible thread of nothingness. <laughs> And he said, I looked to my right, and I could see this tiny blue planet, about the size of a quarter. And on that quarter, as you looked from the perspective of walking on the moon, were all of our troubles, and all of our difficulties, and all of the things that we think are so important, in a quarter, cumulatively, all five and a half billion of us, on this little quarter. All of our worries of whether or not Michigan really can beat uh, Cincinnati. <laughs> can five freshmen really do this? <laughs> all of the concerns that we have, all of the freeways and all of the traffic jams and all, and all on this little quarter. And he said, that moment was a Satori experience, an instant awakening. So you begin to develop as you, as you become more tuned in to this higher consciousness that we'll be talking about here today and begin to tap into it and use it, not just as uh, something that to dazzle your friends with, but as a way to create a, uh, a life of miracles. As you get good at this and, and have this knowing that healing and abundance and happiness and relationship perfection and all of the things that we seem to think are not within our purview to have all become everyday miracles. This consciousness, this, this invisible something or other that winds through it all we get obsessed in our culture with what you call it. You know, what is its name? We fight wars over what you call it. <laughs> and it isn't at all what you call it. It doesn't matter what you call it. It doesn't matter what label you place on it. As Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian, reminded us, once you label me, you negate me. <laughs> And the same is true for this invisible intelligence that allows this whole universe to hang together from the tiniest little cell in our body to the planets moving and to the galaxies beyond. This invisible intelligence makes it all work. It's interesting when you try to get a perspective on what it is and how it works. When I arrived for my second visit to Lancaster in February, I had been having a dream, oh, for the last uh, couple of uh, decades, about uh, being out in the middle of the woods. And in, these, in this woods, I would walk along and I would all of a sudden come upon a, uh, a beautiful pond. 
and it would be frozen over. And I would put on my ice skates, <laughs> and I would just skate effortlessly through, and I would see the trees, and I would hear birds, and, and the snow would be, I was like, this, this, and it would be, a, it's a repetitive dream that I've had over and over again since I was a young boy. See, I grew up not far from here, in Mount Clemens for some years, in a series of foster homes, and then on the east side of Detroit when my mother got her family back together. And after I would deliver the free press in the morning, this was after the Times <laughs> folded, um, I would then go over and, uh, and play hockey. And I played hockey almost every day after school and on weekends down on the Detroit River. I really loved to do it. And I was a defenseman, so I could, I, you know, you really get good at skating backwards and gliding. And when I watch the Olympics, I can do all of those funny little axles and double twists and all of that stuff that they're doing. And skating is just like a way of life with me. I mean, I really, I can feel myself doing it and gliding through it. But the last time I had ice skates on was 1958. <laughs> 1958, the year I graduated from high school, <clears throat> was the last time I had ice skates on. But see, always in my dream, I had this knowing. And I've talked about this here in this church, at services that I've given. Is a knowing that is something that is present in you at the cellular level. In every cell of your being, you have this powerful knowing. Like, if you've learned how to ride a bicycle, and you've been on a bicycle, and that's a very complicated physical act to be riding along on a bicycle. I mean, two tiny little thin wheels, and you're twirling around corners and going no-handed and, and all. You know, you have a knowing, not a belief, that you can do that. And any one of you can go out and pump up the tires and do that, even if you haven't been on a bicycle in 25 years. You know it, you don't believe it. Or you can dive in the water and you know you can swim even though you haven't been there for a long time. This knowing is something that is beyond this body that you're in. You see, the body that skated in 1958, backwards and twirls and circles and, and crashing people into the boards and, and all of that kind of thing, that body is not here today. <laughs> I'm here in a different model. <laughs> in some ways I've outlived that model. The physicalness that allowed me to do that and the memory that is where it was stored, every single physical aspect of that body is gone. It's not it's not here, it's someplace else. And every cell in that body of 34 years ago has been replaced by brand new cells several times over. And even the brain that you think is where that information, that knowing is stored, even that brain is different than the brain physically. Like if you did a chemical analysis of the brain in 1958 and the brain that is here today and sent them to the lab, you would, it would come back and you would find that none of the cells are the same. They all have changed. But the knowing is still there. Now that's very powerful because when I got to Lancaster, the first thing I did, it had been about record cold for, oh, 10, 12 days. It had been below zero every day for the last couple of weeks. And so I went for a walk where I had been in the fall where I had found this pond and I walked out to this pond and there was the pond in my dream. It was exactly the same. It was like I recognized it. I had practically manifested it from this thought process and there it was. And it was frozen solid. It had not just ice, it had what we used to call black ice. <laughs> That's the best ice. That's more than 16 inches thick. 
and you can look down and all you see is blackness. Beautiful ice, just exquisite ice <laughs> for skating. But I didn't have any skates. And there was one kid who works there named Mark, who works in the kitchen, who was out there skating around in a very amateur way, I must say. <laughs> So I said to Mark, I reached into my pocket and I gave him some money, a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, Mark, I need a pair of skates today. <laughs> he said, it's Sunday. I said, I need skates today, Mark. And you can keep the change. And that afternoon, a pair of skates was manifested. <laughs> Brand new hockey skates. And I walked down to that pond that afternoon and I put them on and there I was. I skated 23 hours that week. Just every day I would go out there and I had the time of my life all by my, just living out this wonderful fantasy. And what I want to suggest to you is that the knowing, the powerful knowing that was there, that I could do that, and I could still have all those moves, and, and they were all there, and I didn't fall one time the whole week. And I was able to do all of the things, even though I had a brand new body and a brand new brain and nothing left of that physicalness, whatever that intelligence, that invisible intelligence is that allowed me to do it before, it had somehow transcended my physicalness. And I suggest to you, and Deepak will bring it home powerfully to you, <laughs> that this intelligence is something that we can all access and create not just what we do in our physical world every day, which is where it all comes from, but we can begin to create miracles for ourselves in our lives. Aldous Huxley, in the perennial philosophy, he talked about three things that all ages of man and all civilizations since the beginning of time all have had in common about what I'm talking about here this morning. All ages, all civilizations, from the ancient cavemen and their totems to the African traditions to the New Guinea traditions, to the European and the Eastern traditions and the Indian and the Japanese tradition. And these are people and places that have never intersected with each other in a physical way. All of them have had what, what Huxley called three things they have in common. If you look at the philosophers, the people who have spoken for their people at that time, they've all believed that there is an invisible intelligence beyond the world of the changing. All ages of man somehow their most enlightened beings know this there is an invisible world beyond the world of the changing number two all ages all civilizations who've never intersected with each other have all believed that that invisible intelligence is a part of every single human being all ages that it isn't something that is, some people get and some people don't. It excludes no one. And three, all ages of man have known and believed that the purpose of life is to discover God or to discover whatever it is that you want to call that invisible intelligence that suffuses all form in the universe and allows not only you to take notes and to ice skate, after 34 years of being away from them. But it allows the flowers to grow and it allows the planets to align and it allows the whole thing to exist. So if you want to call it God or soul or spirit or consciousness or Ralph, it doesn't really make any difference what name you put on it. It is not what you call it. It is in every one of us. We all have it. We couldn't be here without it. See, you will discover, as I discovered when my grandmother died, that uh, 
when they weighed her just before her death at the age of 94 at Henry Ford Hospital, that uh, she weighed 133 pounds. And then after she died, and there was this package, this container left that they were preparing to embalm. It wasn't my grandmother. <laughs> it was now just a package. That it weighed 133 pounds as they waited for the death certificate. Powerful metaphor there for me in that moment was that whatever it is that constitutes your very life, <laughs> it doesn't weigh anything. When life leaves the package that you showed up in, the package weighs the same. So your life is something other than the package. And when you get that, you understand that who you are is really this soul with a body rather than this body with a soul. Or as I said, and you'll see it when you believe it, you're a human being. You're not a human being having a spiritual experience. But you're a spiritual being having a human experience. But the quality of that human experience is dependent upon how able and willing you are to make contact with that invisible intelligence that suffuses you and all form in the universe, that is independent and outside of this physical form that you showed up in. This physical form that you showed up in was all handled for you in a split second. All handled in this infinitely, in infinitesimally tiny speck. In this little speck when two little drops of human protoplasm collided. Everything you needed for your form was handled for you. And you can't even begin to comprehend it. A heart starts beating inside a mother's womb. <laughs> six or seven weeks after conception. And it's a complete and total mystery to everyone in the scientific world, in the medical world, and the, the, the only people that even have a grasp on it are the poets. <laughs> Whatever that something is, that invisibleness <laughs> that allows you to be, what I want to suggest is, we'll call it, just for the purposes of my presentation here this morning, we'll call it uh, awareness pure awareness because it's also a term that that Deepak uses you see if you go back two or three hundred years and look at how our current say theology and psychology and sociology and our views on humanity have evolved they really have evolved from our scientific positions that we have taken if you go back a few hundred years the whole world was uh, enamored of uh, what is called Newtonian physics. And in Newtonian physics, they had a postulation that there was the world of matter, the physical world, and that we are made up of this physical world. And this physical world has got building blocks, and that the smallest building blocks of the physical world were these things that they called atoms. And these atoms had within them electrons and neutrons and protons. You studied all of this stuff in physics. And, um, and that was it. The physical world, the building blocks of the physical world were these things, because that was as far as we could go. And so there was the physical world made up of atoms. And then there is the non-physical or the non-material world and that is over here, and since it isn't made up of this stuff here, in order to experience this over here, we had to have something called faith. And we created this faith, this belief that the spiritual world was something outside of the physical world, which was made up of these building blocks, which we could see with our powerful uh, microscopes. Now we come along to the 20th century, and we discover that there are things called quantum physics. And this quantum physics takes these building blocks that we used to think of as the very tiniest particles in matter,
called atoms. And today, with our electron microscopes and our fantastic measuring devices, we have discovered that these, <laughs> these things are like, these atoms are like balloons. <laughs> I mean, they're huge. And so what we've done in quantum mechanics and quantum physics is we have uh, broken them down into subatomic particles to find out what are the building blocks of nature, what are the physical qualities of nature. And we've broken them down, and we break them down, and we break them down into tinier and tinier subatomic particles and tinier ones, and we come up with fancy names for them. And uh, Deepak knows the names of all of this stuff. <laughs> he writes about all of this in a way that you can understand, which is about the only person in the world doing it. And then we discover when we get down and just keep breaking these little quarks and flarks and marks and all of this down into tinier little subquarks, and we, we find out that the building blocks of nature, as we get to the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest particles, that there's no more particles. That the, the stuff that we're made up of is not something outside of us, that at the very tiniest levels, these things that we used to think of as particles are no longer particles, but in fact are pure energy or pure awareness. And that physical and spiritual are not separate from each other, but in fact are connected. And that the very thing that we used to think was outside of us and something that we just had to have faith in order to experience our spirituality we have now discovered scientifically that it is the same. It is us, that particles at the subatomic level don't behave like particles. <laughs> that they're all connected. That there's some kind of invisible force at this tiny, tiny microcosmic level that connects everything. And that in physics, if you take an atom and you take the electrons in an atom and you will start aligning them uh, and manipulating them and you get enough of them in a line after you reach a critical mass all the rest of them align magically some kind of force is there when you get to what they call this critical mass number if there's let's say there's a hundred if you get to 20 25 the other ones stay out there you get to this critical mass boom all the rest start lining up and they call this in physics they call it phase transition now, isn't it interesting to speculate that if we are made up of these things, that in fact, as is the tiniest part of us, so is the cosmos, so is the external, all the intelligence that's within each cell, which is what Ayurveda teaches, is also outside of us as well, and that if every atom within us has that force to align itself, that maybe, just maybe, the same thing is happening right now. <laughs> that if enough of us individual atoms called Wayne and Deepak and Marcy and Sally and Bill begin to align in a certain kind of way, that this thing that Carl Jung talked about, this collective consciousness, is something that we can begin to prove with our physics. You know, it was only 40 or 50 years ago, back in the 50s, that you would ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And they would say, of course not, I'm a scientist. <laughs> now you ask a scientist, do you believe in God? And 95% of them will say, of course, <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> because metaphysics, beyond the physics, are beginning, the physicians, the physical only people, are beginning to say what the metaphysicians have been saying forever. <laughs> As you think so shall you be. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. You will not be punished for your anger. You will be punished by your anger. So said Buddha. So said Christ. So said Muhammad. So said all of the spiritual masters who have ever walked among us. And now the scientists are beginning to say, it is within you. It isn't outside of you. And so we have joined forces. And now the poets who were writing like Blake in Auguries of Innocence, to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, 
to hold eternity in the palm of your hand and infinity in an hour. We are led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night, to perish in a night when the soul slept in beams of light. <laughs> that is so powerful. You were led to believe a lie. When you see with, not through the eye, you can't see with an eye. <laughs> we have a friend who was blinded in, a, in an accident years ago, I'm Sharon Kamlos, who's been here. Either one of us would give one of our eyes so that she could see. <laughs> She can't see with an eye. You see through the eye. The eye doesn't see. The body can't see. The body can't hardly do anything. It's what's directing it inside. Deepak has this wonderful illusion, this wonderful metaphor that he uses where you can go within your body and you can find the command center, <clears throat> but you can never find the commander. Somewhere in there, there's a commander. You can find all the cells, but you can't find who's doing that. That's that something, that mystery. And that, that lie that we've been led to believe is that who we are is this physical body and that it is limited. You see, the physical body, our physical body is what keeps us separate from each other. You have a different body than I do. And you believe in that body, and you believe that you're separate, and therefore you believe in there's things for you and there's things for me. But on a round planet, somehow we've got to learn, and we are in a new phase transition, that on a round planet there's no choosing up sides. <laughs> there are no sides. And we have to discover that not at the physical level, because that's the lie. The physical level, you were born in a night to perish in a night when the soul, which is another name for it, <laughs> slept in beams of light, formless, dimensionless, beyond the world of the physical. And so you become and know that you're this spiritual being having this phenomenal human experience. But your belief is so strong in the lie that Blake refers to, that you are separate, that you are not connected. And yet, if a hijacking, a hijacking takes place in Cyprus, what connects you to the people on that plane, even though it's thousands of miles away on the other part of the one song, the Una one verse song, one song, on the other side of the one song, what connects you is those feelings that you have for those people who are sitting there staring down the barrel of a gun. Your thoughts, that invisibleness connects you and you literally can feel their pain. And when you get good at discovering this higher part of yourself. And this higher part of yourself is the subject of our dialogue this afternoon. I can't wait for it. <laughs> Deepak has just put out a whole program on this. I just finished the last tape uh, just the other day called The Higher Self. Wonderful tape. Six hours of bliss. <laughs> You see, the lie you've led to believe look, works like this. You look, at a, you look at levels of awareness. I've been talking about calling this thing awareness. You look at levels of awareness. And you look at a stone. Now a stone at the quantum level is alive. Do you know that if you take a stone and you crush it and you pulverize it and you make powder out of it and then you pulverize it even further and make it as, as malleable as you possibly can make it, maybe even into liquid, and you send it off to a lab, 
and you send your brain off to a lab and you get back the chemical analysis that is the same. <laughs> There's only so much stuff in the universe to make up the world of form. How, what, with so much carbon, there's, so, many, there's so, so much hydrogen, there's so much oxygen, there's so much nitrogen. There's just like a, a handful of this stuff. And it makes up a stone, and it makes up your brain, and it makes up your arm, and it makes up your nose, and it makes up your house, and it makes up your car, and it makes up the chair, and it makes up everything. It makes up a rhinoceros's horn. <laughs> the same stuff that makes up you. And you believe that you are that stuff? <laughs> Don't you see that there's an organizing intelligence that takes carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen and whatever all of those other chemicals are and says somehow in all of its perfection that Edgar Mitchell described, <laughs> all of its perfection it says this will organize in such a way that it becomes a horn and this will become a stone and this will become a human being. And that stuff is just everywhere. <laughs> and then you look at this stone and you say to yourself as you look at this stone, well, yeah, okay, it's got the same physical properties as I do, but it certainly has, let's just say it has no awareness. <laughs> I mean, what awareness does a stone demonstrate? <laughs> It just sits there. You can kick it. You can do anything you want to it. And yet, at the quantum level, it has enormous awareness. If you let it sit there for a million years in the right conditions, it might be a diamond. <laughs> and in a million years, at the quantum level, is a speck because time doesn't exist there. Time is just... George Carlin defined it because we can't as scientists. So you need the poets and the comedians. <laughs> he said, time is nature's way of preventing everything from happening at once. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, to a quantum physicist, that's not funny. <laughs> and you know why? Because everything is happening at once. <laughs> we just think it's not. <laughs> because we've organized ourselves outside of our abilities. And so... The stone has limited awareness, all right? Then we move up to the other kingdom called vegetables. And the vegetable kingdom has, you wouldn't say it has any awareness in it, it's just, but it's very different than a stone. It certainly has a lot more, a lot more uh, awareness than a stone. If you take one of your house plants and you put it over here in the shade and you've got a sunny part over here, something in the organizing intelligence of that plant says, move over this way <laughs> and you'll find your plants stretching towards the sun and you don't say to them why are you so selfish <laughs> what's the matter with you why aren't you happy with where you are and try to make it feel guilty or try to make it feel bad you accept it for what it is <laughs> You don't get mad at it, you don't punish it, you don't say, all right, if you do that, I'm going to put you in an even drier place, in an even darker place. I'll show you. You don't do that. So plants have awareness, much more so than a stone, even though the physicalness of a plant and a stone are the same. And so is the physicalness of a plant the same as the hair or the skin on your head. <laughs> and a plant's limited awareness doesn't allow it, for example, to demonstrate being upset when you come along and pick its babies. You know, you take its little baby tomatoes away. It doesn't say, oh, my, I went through hours of child labor. How can you do this to me? <laughs> I've been shading these little tomatoes all this time, and now you're just going to take them and slice them up. And, you know, it just, it just, lets, just lets you do it. <laughs> Until you come up to the animal kingdom, which is the next level of, aw level of awareness. And in the animal kingdom, there's much, much more awareness than there is in the vegetable kingdom. I mean, you see animals caring for their young, and you see them migrating, and you see them swimming upstream, and you see them nesting and uh, looking for the right place, and finding mates, and taking care of their offspring. You see all kinds of, of new awareness in the animal kingdom. Most of it is just based on survival. 
on just sort of getting along, <laughs> on handling itself, isn't it? This is the end of side one. Please turn to side two.